Mr. Speaker, as MPs uh, feedback from residents about rising cost of living is not uncommon. However, in the last half a year, the frequency of such feedback has really increased tremendously. I receive such feedback not merely from residents who are in the lower income brackets. I also receive feedback from across the different income tiers. Recently, I attended a feedback session with some condo residents in Aukang, and concerns arising or rising cost of living were raised by many, with whom I spoke to. Mr Speaker, I believe I'm not alone in receiving such concerns and feedback in the House. I therefore support the Workers' Party motion today, calling on the government to review its policy with a view to lower cost of living pressures on Singaporeans and their families. There are different issues of rising cost of living which affect Singaporeans. My colleagues in the Workers' Party will be focusing on different aspects of the rising cost pressures. I will be speaking on the need to relook some aspects of our means testing criteria in public health care and for more help for adults with special needs or disabilities and their caregiving families. Mr. Speaker, with a growing ageing population, healthcare costs are the main concerns of many, including especially many of our seniors and those with no income and yet facing health issues and find themselves struggling to afford essential health care. The current means testing method based on the per capita household income, PCHI, presents some challenges for some certain Singaporeans. The current economic indicators applied to the health care means testing criteria may have their limitations. They look at household income broadly. It overlooks or deprioritizes two important issues. One, the formula looks boldly at rigid household incomes and does not look at deferring or specific needs of specific members of each household when evaluating help <coughs> which should be given. While it's true that both the young, such as children and the elderly, may not have earning power or contribute directly to the PCHI, the elderly are more likely to require nursing care due to the onset of various chronic illnesses associated with ageing. According to the National Population Health Survey conducted in 2020, over 20% 20 of respondents aged 60 to 74 years had diabetes, approximately 75% of those aged 70 to 74 years had hypertension, and 60% in the same age group had high cholesterol. These chronic illnesses often result in increased healthcare spending, including expenses related, related to complications. For example, diabetes and high cholesterol are commonly associated with cardiovascular diseases like coronary heart diseases. In fact, in 2019, approximately 75% of heart attack patients were aged 60 and above. Furthermore, most corporate medical insurance plans typically allow employees to include two family dependents, usually a spouse and offspring, <clears throat> but do not permit the inclusion of elderly dependents. This exclusion is often reflected in corporate insurance plans, such as those offered by Raffles Medical Group, a major corporate insurance provider in Singapore. <clears throat> These plans specify that eligible dependents must be either a spouse or unmarried or unemployed children. As a result, some households with elderly dependents may experience higher out-of-pocket medical expenses compared to households with children, even when their PCHI is the same. It is crucial that we consider such disparities in means testing. One might argue that the seniors in Singapore already have access to a wide range of subsidy schemes aimed at addressing their needs, such as the Medica Generation Package and the Pioneer Generation Package. However, a closer examination of these subsidies offered by the, these packages reveals room for improvement. For instance, the subsidies entitlement for MG and PG cardholders cover chronic conditions and dental services, but are not as extensive in coverage when compared with the coverage of critical illnesses in commonly available medical insurance policies, and subsidies for chronic conditions are capped annually. Two, it does not look at whether family members actually do receive help from family members for the medical fees and expenses of a family member. The choice of residents for retired elderly individuals, whether they decide to stay with their working adult children or live independently, has little impact on the family's financial dynamics. Financial support from working adult children is a personal decision arrived independently of the elderly person's choice of living arrangement. As a result, the retired elderly may appear to have a high PCHI on paper, but they may not receive financial assistance from their children or adequate financial assistance from their children. While the government expects family members to pay for the living and medical expenses of family members, in reality, this may be easier said than done. Many residents have told me that they do not wish to impose on their children and they try to make do with what they have. 
Many have tried unsuccessfully to get financial, public financial assistance when they do not receive money or sufficient money from their children, as their children have told them they do not have enough to contribute to their parents, including those who live with their children in the same households. How can such people receive further subsidy or assistance if help is not forthcoming from family members and without having to request from family members? I see the same problem with some of my residents seeking financial assistance but were not eligible because of household income. An elderly male resident saw me a few times crying with frustration due to the lack of financial support as he is not eligible for more support due to his son's and daughter-in-law's incomes and his son said that he is unable to provide more support. Furthermore, for healthcare means testing, beyond cases of elderly parents living with working children, there may also be other categories of co-occupiers in the same household who may not be currently sharing or co-funding medical expenses of other occupiers of the property. By way of example, <clears throat> Mr A is in his early 60s and working part-time due to his health condition. He lives with two other higher-earning siblings. They share common household expenses. <clears throat> but not individual medical expenses. The household income would be a key consideration, but the amount of subsidy he's entitled under the current PCHI formula. In a case like this, does the government expect Mr A to reach out to his sibling to ask them to share his medical expenses? Will Mr A get help if he applies to the authorities for further subsidy? Mr Speaker, currently when the per capita household income of a particular household um, <clears throat> PCHI is zero, the government will look at the annual value of the property that the household is living in. In July this year, the Honourable Member for our Junior GRC, Mr Jaro Giam, urged the, the Minister for Health, the Ministry of Health, to consider removing the AV component, the annual value component, for household with no income. <clears throat> Senior Parliamentary Secretary Ms Raya Mazam said in response, and I quote, on on the member's point of considering to remove this, this is a broader point we are looking at, unquote. I hope the government will consider removing this. Mr Speaker, households with zero PCHI but higher annual values often comprise of retirees who are in their twilight years and may have a family member who is seriously unwell and seeking medical treatment. The Minister for Health himself acknowledged in a written answer to a parliamentary question in February this year that annual value is an imperfect proxy for determining financial need especially for those who are asset-rich but cash-poor. There may be a variety of reasons why such individual owners are unable to monetize their property. As we age, we may grow more attached to our homes, the neighbourhoods we are familiar with, and the communities we have built over the years, and that these may not even be the reasons for some among us for not being able to move up to a lower-priced property for whatever reasons. Monetizing, right-sizing or downsizing may not always be feasible or desirable. In addition, we are being encouraged to age in place. But owners living in their own properties are not the only people who are affected by the annual value issue. There are also family members who are caught by the rule. Besides non-owner spouses, there are siblings, children, aunts, uncles and cousins who may be living in the same property <coughs> who may be caught by this rule. Such family may not be able to <coughs> such family members may not be able to get their relatives in the same household to pay for their medical expenses. They may not be able to afford a place of their own just to qualify for more state subsidies. There are also cases of family members being co-owners of a family property or co-inheriting such property after a parent has passed on. I've known a few of such cases where residents inherited a family property together with <coughs> fellow family members. They continue to live in their own property. Family property is kept for use by other family members and this could be a residential or even commercial property. And there is no near-term prospect <coughs> of the property being sold and proceeds to be distributed. These non-occupier owners are caught by the annual value issue when it comes to medical subsidies and also for other packages and schemes from other ministries. Such people have to appeal every time against their non-access <coughs> for subsidies or benefits, and the outcome may not always be consistent. Before I leave this point, I also say that whether a person is an owner or a non-owner, it would not be right to expect a person living in a property with higher annual value, battling a serious disease, to have to make arrangements to move out of his or her home or to sell his or her home to raise funds for the very medical treatment he or she needs. 
Next, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to discuss the needs of families who have family members with special needs or with mental health issues and requiring care for family members. The burden placed upon these families is immense, and I hope that the state can extend more help. While the numbers of such families may not be large, their plight is significant and warrants our attention. According to SG Enable, 3.5% of people aged between 18 to 49 in our country are disabled. These numbers are not negligible, and we must recognise the challenges faced by these families. Moreover, data from MSF estimated that in 2022, there were approximately 32,000 persons with disabilities aged between 15 to 64, with about 1,000 of them unemployed and 22,000 outside the labour force. These figures underscore the urgency of addressing their needs. Moreover, for families where such adults with special needs or mental issues requiring, require their aged, aging parents to continue to care for them, the burden of caregiving both physically and financially can be tremendous. I have some suggestions to provide for better assistance to these families. One, we should create a list of non-critical illnesses that necessitate long long-term care and force individuals out of employment. This list would include conditions such as early onset dementia, severe autism, Down syndrome, schizophrenia and Parkinson's disease. Such conditions can be financially burdensome for families and <clears throat> access to social support for these individuals and their families is currently limited. For example, eligibility for claims under CareShield Life remains limited to individuals who are unable to perform at least three activities of daily living, ADLs. However, the above-mentioned ailments, while detrimental enough to put one out of employment, do not always impact one's ability to perform the ADLs. Many insurance plans cover critical illnesses, and the insurance products available on the market that cover non-critical illnesses remain limited. Besides, some of these non-critical illnesses are congenital, making afflicted individuals excluded from medical insurance scheme, which require that one must be free of pre-existing medical conditions before they are onboarded. The eligibility criteria for casual life can be expanded to include consideration of those who can still perform ADLs but are unable <coughs> to earn a stable income due to non-critical illnesses. This aligns with the original intentions of casual life, which is targeted at individuals with long-term care needs. Two, for such individuals with non-critical illnesses, we should offer more subsidies with medical supplies, consultations, treatment, rehabilitation and daycare services. Medical expenses for such individuals are not limited to specialists, outpatient care or inpatient care, but also include other essential areas like medical supplies and rehab rehabilitation. Three, increase subsidies for inpatient and outpatient specialist treatment for both individuals with non-critical illnesses and their caregivers should be made available. While there are existing subsidies for long-term residential care, daycare and rehab, rehabilitation, many families do not meet the eligibility criteria due to the ceiling limit set by the PCHI or even the annual value of their property. For example, the PCHI upper limit to qualify for daycare subsidies set at 2008. This can make it challenging for working adults taking care of their disabled children <coughs> as their income may exceed this limit. Should a working adult take care of his or her disabled ch child because the child is not capable of independent living and let's say he or she earns about $7,000 per month, taking the median salary of someone in 40 to 44 years old age group and the spouse is a full-time caregiver without any income, this works up to a PCHI of about $2,333 per month. The family only marginally qualify for 30% subsidies and time entitlement for daycare services. Furthermore, the Senior Mobility Fund is targeted at seniors aged 60 and above, leaving out younger persons with disabilities who also require nursing and rehabilitation support. The younger PWDs, in spite of their nursing and rehabilitation needs, will not be able to access the fund. And even if the age criteria is extended to include younger PWDs, they do not qualify if the PCHI is more than 2000 and the annual value of their property is more than 13000 in short, I'm concerned that those affected are not getting enough support. There are PWDs in the working age group with rehabilitation needs, and I hope the Senior Mobility Fund is extended to include these. I also hope that PWDs in the working adult age groups qualify for subsidies in daycare and residential care. Besides the opportunity cost of lost income, they should not be penalised just because they live in a, with a working family member out of necessity. <coughs> Four, more support should be given to caregivers with of adults with special needs or disabilities. While we do have existing 
<coughs> grants and concessions such as the caregivers training grant, home caregiving grant and migrant domestic levy concession. Some of these are limited to households where the care recipient is elderly and exclude families where elderly parents are caregivers to disabled children. This disparity can be addressed. Can caregiving grants such as the home caregiving grant and the migrant domestic worker levy concession <coughs> for aged persons with disabilities be extended to households where the care recipients are not seniors and may not have and may have no uh, ADL issues, but are involuntarily unemployed because of their medical condition. After all, the conditions that threaten employment, for example, early onset dementia, severe autism, Down syndrome, schizophrenia, etc., are neurological or psychiatric conditions that affect soft skills like cognitive and communication skills and may not always affect one's ability to perform ADLs. And so to use ADLs as an indicator in eligibility determination for grants is not comprehensive. Mr Speaker, I hope that more help can be given to support caregivers, especially caregivers who have to give up their full-time jobs to care for their family members and do not have an income or may need more financial support. For a start, I hope the home giving Home caregiving grant can be increased beyond the current $400 for deserving cases. In closing, Mr. Speaker, I hope the current means testing <coughs> formula can be further improved upon to take into account the specifics of an individual's financial situation, particularly his or her cash flow <coughs> and health condition, and more health care and make health care more affordable and accessible for all. More help should be extended to adults with special needs or other forms of disability who are in the working adult age group but are unable to work and requires part of full-time care from family members, especially families where the parents are getting on in age. Mr Speaker, I support the original motion. <laughs>